Recording in progress.
Hello, thank you for joining us. Good. Okay, thank you for joining us. My name is Bethany McCorkle. I have the privilege of being the communication director for Ohio Attorney General Dave Yost. We will hear some exciting news from him. From a process standpoint, the AG will speak um, and then we will have Q&A. If there's any issues, please let us know. We had an issue before, um, but you'll definitely wanna hear from the AG and he's happy to answer any questions. So. With no further ado, Attorney General Dave Yost. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us virtually. Uh, this is a, an historic day for Ohio. We have a, a finalized deal with the uh, three major distributors of opiates uh, of Ohio's lawsuit, which was uh, set to begin shortly. Why are we here? You know, from 2000 to 2020, nearly 39,000 Ohioans died of opiate overdoses. The number of people who are struggling with opiate addiction is uh, certainly many times that and it remains a very difficult challenge and a tragedy uh, in all of our communities and many of our families across uh, Ohio. We had begun making some progress. We saw the rate of opiate overdose deaths declining uh, in the middle part of the 2010s. And then we got to 2020 and uh, COVID-19 and the pand pandemic, and the numbers shot up again. Uh, in fact, we hit a new record uh, after seeing some significant improvement uh, a few years back. And unfortunately today, we're in as bad a shape as we've ever been. Winston Churchill once said during uh, World War II that uh, this is not the beginning of the end, uh, but it might be the end of the beginning. I think that's where we are today because with this uh, resolution, we have some important controls that are in place and monitoring provisions that will help protect Ohioans for the kind of uh, reckless distribution and overprescriptions that we had seen in previous years. More important, we have one Ohio. Uh, thanks to Governor Mike DeWine uh, and my office's work along with counsel for our local governments across Ohio. We came to an agreement oh, well over a year ago uh, that we were going to try to deal with this together, that we were gonna try to enter into uh, a settlement and a distribution mechanism that would push the money out into our local communities where the services are and where people live their lives and that we would do it cooperatively. I was very proud of that agreement that we negotiated and uh, it came to the test this summer. The opiate distributors and uh, the many of the state's attorneys generals developed a framework for a settlement deal that could include the entire country potentially. But because of all the local uh, cities and counties that had sued, the attorneys general were not able to just ink a deal. We had to have buy-in. And across the country, that remains a major issue. Uh, I know many of my colleagues are struggling to try to reach consensus in their states but not in Ohio. We have a partnership with our local, uh, local governments. Uh, it hasn't been an easy thing to do, but we've worked together every step along the way. And today, Ohio's trial date has been settled. Just a quick reminder, one Ohio means that we have local control. 85% of the money from this settlement is uh, going to flow directly to the local governments either through direct payments, about 30% that goes straight to them, and about 55% will go through a foundation 
uh, whose board is controlled by the local governments and will make regional decisions about how we're going to educate, prevent, and abate this opioid, uh, opioid crisis. This summer, we came to the uh, test of that plan uh, when we had to, in relatively short period of time, ask our local governments, many of whom were on recess from council meetings and commissioner meetings uh, for the summer, uh, to come back, um, some cases break their vacations, uh, in order to uh, consent to this, because the way the global deal was, was put together, the uh, amount of money that would come to the state was affected by how many of the local governments signed on. And it was touch and go for a while. We were concerned that we were going to miss tens of millions of dollars because we couldn't uh, develop a, uh, a consensus. Fortunately, we got to the place where all but one litigating subdivision signed on and uh, Ohio's uh, place is now secure. So in addition to that, we have a trial. Nobody, uh, the other states are not uh, dealing with a trial date. And we don't know if the global deal is actually going to be settled. We don't know how many local governments and other states are going to participate in this. Uh, we don't even know if there will ultimately be a global deal. I remain confident that there will be, uh, but there's no way to guarantee that and lots of moving parts. So we negotiated a separate Ohio uh, settlement um, for our trial because it was imminent. Um, we were in fact supposed to have a important hearing today and trial was to begin shortly. We have uh, a number of important provisions that are protecting Ohio and its, and its communities. And we're gonna go into those in a moment, but at a high level, we have $808 million that is coming to Ohio to fix the mess, what the lawyers call abatement of the problem. That's an improvement from the global settlement because we, we're able to get the companies to agree to pay the state's attorney fees uh, on top of the settlement. Uh, that means that the settlement will not be reduced by any legal fees for the state's lawyers. Secondly, and everybody remembers the tobacco settlement and lots of people are still not very happy about the way those monies in the end, were diverted to things other than tobacco cessation and treatment. Well, the consent decree that will be filed in Madison County Court and remain under supervision of the court and enforceable by the court holds that no money goes for potholes or bureaucrats. It's all going to try, go to try to clean up this mess uh, that we have from the opiate epidemic. Here's maybe the best thing. Ohio is first in line in the country. Money can begin to flow under our settlement as early as November. Now, we still have to get ratification finally from all of the folks that said, yes, we're in on the global deal. But since this is a better deal, I don't think that that's going to actually be a problem. And best of all, it doesn't matter what happens with the other states. Other states can say yes or no, but we get our deal. Other states can only get maybe a third or a half of what they're entitled to under the global settlement because their local subdivisions uh, don't come along. That doesn't impact the money coming to Ohio. This would not have been possible without a huge number of people that worked so hard on this. Among them are our two trial dogs at the Cincinnati law firm of KMK, our outside counsel, uh, who did a tremendous amount of work on this. I wanna give a shout out to Greg Utter and Joe Callow. Thank you, gentlemen. It's been a pleasure to work with you. You're great lawyers.
but maybe most important to this entire process has been a uh, longtime employee of this office, former Jackson County prosecutor, uh, who is now the deputy attorney general for the for major litigation in my office. He's worked on this since before I was attorney general uh, from the beginning of this lawsuit. He knows every bell, every whistle, and every crack in the wall uh, on this entire lawsuit and the problem itself. Coming from Jackson, Ohio, so hard hit in Appalachia, he has a special affinity, a special passion for trying to fix the mess that we find ourselves in because of this opiate epidemic. I'm going to ask him to come uh, to the podium now and fill in a few more of the details, and then we'll take questions and answer. Mr. Blanton. Thank you, General. <clears throat> in order to understand why this is such an important day for Ohio and why this is the right thing for Ohio to do, you have to understand a little bit about the process overall. The national settlement, the global settlement, as Attorney General Yost said, is still up in the air. There are still a lot of ways that it can fail. Now, plenty of Attorney Generals have signed on, but the subdivisions are still out there. That's a real risk. What we have done in partnership with our local communities, and that's been key to this, is we have secured Ohio's future. We've secured up to $808 million coming into Ohio. What can stop that $808 million from coming in? A lack of participation a lack of partnership, but you know, we haven't seen that. By working with Council for the Political Subdivisions and working with subdivisions directly, we have put these companies in a position to where they know that it's worth it to settle with Ohio. Another reason the settlement is the right thing at the right time is because of risk. With trials, there are always risks. We have the risk of adverse jury finding, we have a risk of COVID. Uh, things that we don't control, but what we now know we do control is Ohio's future in this $808 million. Also, one of the key components of this agreement is it keeps the money flowing. The companies do have the right to prepay a limited number of payments. Now, under the national deal, the companies could have then offset portions of those payments against the next following years, up to three following years. That wasn't good enough for Ohio. For Ohio, they can go ahead and prepay us. They can give us extra money on the front, but that comes off the very back end. So you're 18, you're 17, you're 16 putting real money into Ohio's communities right now in a way that doesn't harm them, that doesn't create gaps. We also incorporated the One Ohio Memorandum of Understanding into the agreement. We wanna memorialize that this is partnership money, that this is money that's dedicated to abatement, that's dedicated to local communities. We pushed the companies, they were good partners in it. The subdivisions came along, they were good partners in it. And what does that mean? It's exactly what Attorney General Yost said a few minutes ago is the One Ohio Memorandum of Understanding allocates money 30% to the subdivisions, 55% to the foundation, and 15% to the state. But more importantly, what it does, is it puts certain uses around that. They can only use that money to fix this problem. And that is massive. We also managed to protect Ohio from the attorney fees. Uh, as AGO said, of that $808 million, $0 is going to state of Ohio's attorney's fees. The companies are picking up that tab and that's good for Ohio. The companies have also agreed to contribute to the attorney fees for local subdivisions and their litigation expenses to the tune of around $30 million. And again, that's separate and above that $808 million that we can get in abatement money. We also wrestled with these companies to bring accountability and responsibility to this program. We needed insight into their business models. This agreement allows Ohio and hopefully soon the nation to see where drugs are being distributed, where these controlled substances are going. And if the global fails, Ohio still keeps that right because the companies will have to file with the attorney general reports of the controlled substances sold here in the state of Ohio. And additionally, they will file reports for pharmacies located on Ohio's borders. Now, it's the attorney general you said, I'm from Southern Ohio originally, and I can tell you that down there, there were a lot of pills that flowed back and forth between Kentucky and West Virginia and Ohio and we had no insight into this. This agreement will fix it. Another thing that was very important for Attorney General Yost is to make sure that Ohio was getting the best deal Ohio can, that the companies or state didn't come in later and hold them up for more money. 
because of a most favored nation provision that is incorporated into this agreement, the companies can't do that. No state has the right to get more money than Ohio gets, unless those companies are staring down the barrel of a trial. And there are very, very few of those out there. And also the unique thing about the Ohio Memorandum of Understanding, I'm sorry, the, the Ohio Settlement, is that now it's not just states that the companies have to think about. It's not just states that can trigger Ohio's right to get what we're due. It's political subdivisions. It guards against the companies going out and picking off groups of political subdivisions in an effort to influence the attorneys general to join. The last thing we build in is possibly one of the most important things is enforceability and accountability. If these companies don't comply, we have a provision that brings those violations right back to the Madison County Court of Common Pleas, right back in front of a judge that we know, a judge who's familiar with this case, a judge who knows the parties, knows the history, and knows the importance of strict and meaningful compliance. It has been a long fight. Attorney General Yost has led it well. He's the AG who stepped up and said the September of 2019 uh, proposed agreement wasn't good enough. He called it a pile of lumber. And because of that, the nation is in a better place. Because of his work right now, Ohio is in a better place. We are leading yet again through partnership. And that's going to mean more money going to local communities. More money for abatement, more money for relief, more money protecting Ohio from the horrors of this epidemic. We did it through partnership, through leadership, and through vision. And uh, it's been a great thing to be a part of. General? Thank you. Bethany, do you have any instructions for how questions are to be asked? Uh, we have one question coming through right now. There are questions through the chat function. Questions through the chat function. So, all right, we'll hear the first question. First question is from Jeremy Pelzer from Stigma.com. Jeremy, can you unmute? Jeremy, can you hear? Hi, can you hear me? There we go. Hi, Thank General. You. I wanted to ask, how, in the end, how many local governments signed on to the settlement? Do you have a final number for that? I know it's all but one. Jonathan, what is that total? I believe in terms of litigating subdivisions is somewhere in, I think that's about 170. We also have non-litigating subdivisions I think that's well over 270 now. I don't have the number in front of me. We can get that for you, certainly. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Titus Wu with the Columbus Dispatch. Hi, Attorney General. Um, I was just wondering if you could maybe more go more into detail in terms of, you know, kind of the, um, I was just a bit unclear on, on kind of the enforceability and, you know, kind of accountability portions of the agreement in terms of, you know, making sure this, you know, kind of crisis doesn't happen again. Oh, thank you for letting me clarify that. Uh, the court that had the case is filed in, we will uh, memorialize this settlement agreement uh, in a, what's called a consent decree. It's a court order um, in that court. The court will retain jurisdiction. So if somebody breaks that, uh, the agreement, we have the ability to go back to the court and uh, enforce the order through a judicial process. Uh, in terms of preventing it from happening again, uh, I'm afraid that we've been wrestling with addiction uh, in this world for thousands of years. And uh, it's not going to go away simply. I uh, once talked to an addiction specialist who said, you know, every addiction diagnosis is secondary to some other injury. Uh, 
a workplace injury, a car wreck, um, surgery. We added ruefully, we still don't know how to fix a broken heart. And there's a lot of those out there. If there are no other questions, we will conclude our uh, I'm told to wait. The next question is from Dustin. Dustin, can you hear us? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, Attorney General Yost. I was wondering um over how many years will the state receive this settlement money? Uh the term of the agreement is for 18 years as uh uh, Deputy Attorney General Blanton said the companies do have a right to prepay, um, you know, if they have a year where they have extra cash or there's tax consequences, I suppose. I don't know why they would necessarily decide to do that. They're allowed to prepay um, a certain amount. However, um, unlike the global agreement, for Ohio, that does not mean they skip the next year, uh, which was really important because I don't want an interruption in the funding. As this money comes through, this is gonna be a, a revenue stream year to year to year. And as, well, as we treat, as we educate, as we prevent uh, addiction, that needs to be a year to year uh, kind of thing. And I, I don't wanna see a year where there's no rem uh, revenue coming in. So if they elect to prepay, uh, that 18 years could shrink to as little as 15. The next question is from Patrick from Watchman. Oh, Patrick. Hello. Um, <clears throat> there, there was mention that uh, Southern Ohio uh, is certainly an area that has been hit hard by this epidemic. Um, uh, here in Pike County, that's certainly the case. Um, with the breakdown of the 808 million, um, is it kind of based more on, you know, population size, or is it kind of more on that overall impact? Like, how is it kind of determined, like, um, to these uh, litigating populations? Uh, great question, and you're really touching it. One of the things that was very complicated about this litigation, uh, because uh, some states wanted it, Cal California, for example, wanted it just based on population. Uh, a place like Ohio, uh, or especially Kentucky and West Virginia, we really were looking more at impacts, um, whether that's uh, uh, equivalent doses or overdose deaths or diagnosis. Um, there is a formula that takes all of those things into account and I believe that that's still up on the web, Jonathan. Yes. Uh, so uh, every community can look at uh, how that distribution works. But it's important to remember that the 55% that goes to the foundation is going to be distributed by that board among 14 um, individual regions. Uh, and the reason for that is in some of our communities, you know, the settlement might only add up to maybe forty or fifty thousand dollars, which isn't really enough to do anything with. It. There's not enough scale there to have an impact, um, and so by doing this by region, uh, we're going to able be, enable local regions to scale up uh, so that they can uh, pool the money. And for example, uh, in a sparsely populated region. Uh, they might decide that they want to create a treatment center um, and direct a portion of the region's financing into that. Uh, so it's a little bit complicated. If you have a follow-up question, I have uh, the expert back here who can bore you um, beyond tears with the numbers and percentages, I'm sure. Any follow-up? Uh, Gabriel. Hi, can you hear me? I, uh, I can't. Okay. Uh, 
Mr. Attorney General, you and your deputy have done an excellent job of uh, spelling out the terms of this agreement. Uh, if you could unpack something for me, though, uh, the tobacco settlement you referenced was uh, famously or infamously handled. What are the guidelines or where could I find the specifics of what would be permitted as far as expenditures under this settlement? Well, it has to be directly related to abating the opiate addiction epidemic. Um, Jonathan, could you ch uh, maybe spell out a little bit more what the agreement will show? Certainly. Thank you. Absolutely. So the, you will find that kind of information in a couple of different places. The One Ohio Memorandum of Understanding uh, has an approved purposes section. And also, I believe it's Exhibit A to that, uh, has a list of what we're calling the Ohio abatement purposes. And those are things like treatment. Uh, there's law enforcement. There's community intervention. Uh, there's counseling services. Also, in the global settlement agreement, which Ohio's eventual settlement agreement will look much like, there's a list of approved purposes there, too. Uh, it was very important to the attorneys general, uh, to the communities, and to the companies that the vast, vast majority of this money go to fixing the problem, cleaning up the mess, and they have put the right guardrails in place to make sure that happens. Thank you, Jonathan. Anybody else? We do have we're good. Yes, sir. All right. Um, so my question, uh, there was mention of the one litigating population that did not sign on. I believe that's the Sayada County Commissioners. Um, I was just wondering if there had been any conversation with them um, at all or since their decision or um, things like that. So look, uh, Sido County, county seat of Portsmouth, uh, was the site of the uh, 2015 book, uh, Sam Cononis, uh, Dreamland, that was a national bestseller that really brought forth the depth and human story behind this tragedy. Um, they felt that uh, they wanted to go their own way. This is deeply, deeply personal for the leaders of that community. And I wish them Godspeed. If there's something that I can do to be helpful to them, to be successful, uh, I certainly uh, want to do that. And uh, you know, my heart goes out to the people of Sayota County. All right, thank you very much for your interest and uh, we're looking forward to uh, better days ahead. Thank you. Record.